This is Richard R.J. Escal for Free Speech TV, and we are here at Netroots Nation 2018 with Lori Wallach. Lori is the Director of Public Citizens Global Trade Watch program, and she's here now to update us on what's going on in the world of trade negotiations. So first of all, Lori, welcome. Thank you very much. Secondly, so what is going on with NAFTA? I see the headlines, I get the news alerts, but I am, I will confess, even though I've covered it as a journalist myself, I'm a little confused as to where we stand with the negotiations that the Trump administration has conducted. It's super confusing. So NAFTA's been in place for almost 25 years. We've lost almost a million jobs certified U.S. workers, specific folks, by just one narrow program under the Department of Labor. We've seen a half a billion in corporate attack, ISDS, investor state tribunal cases paid out, attacks in environmental, health, and other laws. And the administration launched negotiations one year ago to change that agreement. There's part of the administration that wants it to basically be like the Trans-Pacific Partnership on steroids, TPP 2.0. And but we the, defeated TPP and, because it was so bad for the working people of this country. And Congress, there just wasn't a majority in Congress. You know, Trump came in and said, I did that. But actually Congress, before he ever was elected, said, not doing that. Another part of the administration is saying, uh -uh, we got to get rid of the sovereignty problems in the NAFTA. We need to get rid of the incentives for outsourcing. And that wing of the party so far has won the debate internally. And that is led by the guy who's the chief trade negotiator. So there could be a deal, at least with Mexico, in the next week to two weeks that might do a bunch of the things that unions, Democrats, and progressives in Congress have been demanding for the last two decades. It might take out those outrageous corporate outsourcing incentives. It might get rid of the investor state tribunals where corporations can sue to make us taxpayers pay off having good laws. It might, for the first time, put in real labor standards with swift and certain enforcement. And there might actually be a wage standard for what, how much workers need to get paid to get the benefits for the product to get the benefits of the agreement. Now I say if, because at any moment the president could cut the legs up from under the team that's pushing that. But right now, even though it seems improbable, all that stuff that we've been asking for is close to being part of the deal. Now there's plenty of bad stuff we'll have to watch for. Will they give new rights for big pharma? Will they put bad stuff in food safety? But a bunch of these economic issues, to some degree, the guy who's doing the negotiations has more in common on that set of issues with the unions than he has with the Republicans in Congress or, frankly, most of the rest of the administration. So let's talk about what the, some of the ramifications of those issues would be. We can leave aside the uh, what would be left behind after all those heads exploded uh, <laughs> from the notion of the Trump administration doing something that is actually good. So we'll leave that aside and just say, let's talk about a couple of those issues. Okay, you mentioned sovereignty. Uh, I think what you mean by that, but let me know, is, uh, is that the court uh, system is overruled in current trade agreements by what they call the ISDS, the Investor State Dispute Resolution System, which is basically a kind of privatized uh, Uber court that uh, makes decisions and that, according to studies, has very heavily leaned in favor of large corporations and its findings. Not surprising, perhaps, since the arbitrators, or judges tend to be corporate lawyers. Um, is that what we're talking about here, a possible change to that system? That's right. So at the heart of NAFTA is not really trade stuff, it's these investor rights. And the investor state dispute settlement system had never been in a trade agreement until NAFTA. NAFTA is where a very bad model got set. So this ISDS system empowers multinational corporations to skirt domestic laws and courts and sue a government in front of three corporate attorneys to demand unlimited sums of compensation if they think any special foreign investor right provided in NAFTA has been violated by a U.S. law, a court ruling, an environmental regulation. It doesn't matter if U.S. court said that stuff was fine. These three corporate attorneys who are not subject to any appeal can limit 
can award unlimited cash from, to be paid by us taxpayers, including for the future expected profits of the company if the law had never happened, talk about heads exploding, through a system that is in NAFTA but doesn't exist in our law. So when we think about NAFTA and this negotiation, it's an ongoing agreement doing damage. So part of the assessment is not only what would we ideally have, mm -hmm. but can we take out things that are doing oh, ongoing yeah. damage? Mm -hmm. So if they take out ISDS, where right now $14 billion of additional claims are pending, mm -hmm. in addition to the half a billion that's been paid out, on the tax on climate policy, energy policy, tax expands, water policy, timber policy, we shut down that future damage. And of, and of course, when we talk about the current and future damage, it's not just the penalties that have been assessed, but it's, it's, the chill. The, it's what people haven't done. I mean, I always think of if a company with foreign investors was selling poison, toxic tuna to the American people and a court ruling said you can't do that, uh, that they, the company, the people who might suffer the effects of it, the state government or whomever made the decision, might choose instead of paying billions of dollars to tell the American people, shut up and eat your mercury, right? I mean, that's one possibility. And that wouldn't even show up in the numbers you just quoted. Well, and it's, it's one step worse, because think of right now the case where Exxon is being, uh, sorry, where Texaco, well, yes, now, now Exxon is being asked to pay for the pollution that it did in Ecuador. Mm -hmm. And they polluted the Amazon when their previous uh, company they bought, Texaco, did. All right they actually have sued in these corporate tribunals to make the government of Ecuador pay them back for the amount they're supposed to pay to clean up the toxic disaster that they were adjudicated to have caused in a court, which they appealed all the way to the Supreme Court. That's an example of how corporate crime can be made to pay. So if we can get that out, very big deal. And also, because countries around the world are saying, oh, I think we want to get out of the system. The U.S. has always been pushing it. If we get out of it, it's a really important symbol to the rest of the world. Second big thing is, we are still seeing, even after a million jobs have been lost under NAFTA, U.S. jobs, every week we're seeing more jobs go. And they're high-end, middle-class jobs. They're now in the before, service sector. Now, before we get to jobs, just quick interjection on sovereignty, which is, I have wondered for years, and I'm sure you have too, why conservatives aren't jumping on this sovereignty issue, because they're always talking about America, America first. Um, <laughs> when Trump ran on some of these issues, including trade, and I remember people telling me in Washington, oh, voters don't vote on trade. My answer was always, go drive around Michigan and well, see the trade signs, no TPP. So uh, when Trump ran on this issue, I thought it was just rhetoric. So I'm very interested to see what happens here. Now let's talk about jobs. You make a great point, which is not only have we lost, what, a million plus jobs so yeah, far? Million certified that we've got, we're losing more each day. So what is in play right now and on that front? So the question is, are they going to take out the incentives in NAFTA that promote job outsourcing? And there are two really big ones. One is the agreement bans by American and by local. So a company like General Electric that gets billions in government contracts every year before NAFTA had to make that stuff here from the Buy American Act since Roosevelt. Basically, our tax dollars go to make goods in the, to buy goods made in the U.S. and we reinvest in our communities. So NAFTA waived that. GE went to Mexico under that waiver. It's now Buy American even if it's made in Mexico. We would basically bring back some manufacturing jobs there, but also with the Buy Local movement, which is more environmental, also all the long distance shipping of things that the right. government buys would be improved. So that's an environmental and labor win. The other big thing is, as well as the investor state rules, there is also a set of investor privileges that make it less risky and cheaper to outsource jobs. So the idea is if you get rid of the right. substantive rules, you're not pushing jobs out the door. So getting rid of that also would help with the job outsourcing. The one thing they're talking about adding that can make a big difference is the major pull factor for outsourcing. And that is the super low wages in Mexico. Mm -hmm. So in the 25 years of NAFTA, wages in Mexico have gone down to the point where they're now 40% lower than coastal China. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. How that's happened in part is Mexican labor law allows what are called protection unions. A U.S. company goes, builds a super fancy high-end auto assembly plant. Looks like just a brand new one that would be in 
Michigan. The workers are not even hired, and the government, a faith union, and the company create a union, negotiate a contract. The worker comes in there and is being paid a buck sixty an hour in a high-end manufacturing job and says, that's crap, I'm going on strike. At which point they go to jail because they've just violated the contract they didn't know existed, protection fake contract with a union they never voted for. This in the old days used to be called a sweetheart contract with a now uh this is an important point, too, politically, because sometimes the argument you hear on the trade issue is that we're helping workers in other countries. We shouldn't be selfish. And actually, you're saying wages have gone down as a result of the practices that have developed around these industries. So what is on, in play now in terms of that? So Democrats in Congress, the progressive Democrats and the unions have said, OK, you want to actually make a difference, put in actual labor standards, which are the right to vote for your union, vote for your own contract, a right that a violation of the basic labor rights is a violation of this agreement subject to trade sanctions against the government who's not enforcing it, and make all of that subject to enforcement that is certain and swift. So you bring up Mexican wages. This would be a win-win for workers in North America, top to bottom. That maybe. And this is the one that's the hardest to believe given this administration has been out like with an axe against workers. That may end up getting renegotiated. And if those standards are in and there's a result, you could actually be trying to fix the labor disaster, the labor rights disaster in Mexico, and you would basically get rid of one of the push factors for race to the bottom outsourcing. That would be something worth looking at harvesting. Yeah, you know, and this is something that, if I recall correctly, I think every single trade deal that's gone through since the Clinton administration, this is what the American people have been told is in the deal. And We've always is. been told we're, we, this deal will strengthen workers' rights in the countries we're negotiating with. We're helping those workers. We're helping build unions. We're helping put in protections. Meanwhile, we're, uh, labor leaders in Ecuador are getting assassinated by the Colombia. dozens. Colombia. Guatemala. And, Guatemala getting assassinated, we do nothing, a slave labor, a child labor is going on in, is it Malaysia? And, uh, and somehow we managed to look the other way when we want to do a deal. Uh, so this would actually be a major part. What's the likelihood of that now, happening? This is the thing that people are like, okay, I get the getting rid of the investor state, because what we think of as democracy and corporate rights, they think of as sovereignty. So I understand that one. And, you know, we kind of understand the incentives to outsource of the investment rules, but they're going to add labor standards? What? Well, from a certain perspective from the conservatives, the idea of using low wages or environmental toxics dumping is seen as social dumping. Dumping is a trade practice where you basically sell a good below the actual cost right. of production. So for some of the conservative folks, they, you know, while we think as internationalists, every human being deserves basic rights. The basic right to represent themselves in their work. The basic right not to have children working. We think of these as international norms, and that's our worldview. From the conservatives, what they basically say is, if there's going to be externality of costs, People are going to be paid a wage that isn't a living wage in Mexico. Toxics are going to be dumped on the ground. And a company operating in the U.S. couldn't get away with that crap. That's effectively like dumping. They're producing it below the fair price of to, that should be produced. Because the cost of not dumping should be included in the price. I so what they're basically arguing is we should raise wages, not because it's the moral imperative you got, we think of, but because Actually, if we're going to have competition, it's either going to be a race to the bottom and the U.S. will lose, or we're going to have to pull these guys up and it's, it's a level playing field. And or so there's a third option, which is that we start dumping too, <laughs> which is, of course, what they really want. But in the meantime, you're absolutely right. So is there anything else we, in the minute or so we have left? Is there anything else people should be looking for? Because this is fascinating stuff to me. Well, and it's so important and people are not talking about it enough. Two really big things. One, there could be an announcement soon. And if there is, it's going to be really important for progressives not to have the, re the reflexive, ooh, if Trump did it, it must right, be bad. Absolutely. Because this could be a unicorn. If we see a unicorn coming out of the very dark woods that are the Trump administration, we should not shoot at that unicorn. We should take it in and try and get it safely into the barn. It may be the only good thing that comes out of this administration. So that's number one. 
Number two is... And, before, and, and just real quickly, I also have noticed a certain reflexivity that that's kind of happening to a certain extent. That the never that the anti-Trump crowd, which I consider myself a proud member of, is uh, some of some of the people are saying, well, you know, these trade deals are pretty good, and Trump's, you know, stepping on them. Uh, so I'm with you on that. And what's the other one? The second one is to think about knowing enough to know what to think about it. So I recommend folks go to two websites. One is TradeWatch.org, and there's a Trade Data Center that you can put in your zip code and find out what jobs have been lost to NAFTA. And then there's another one called www.replacenafta.org. That will send you the signal from what the labor movement thinks, progressive groups like us, Bernie Sanders, Senator Warren, what everyone thinks when the deal gets announced. So you will know, do we have the unicorn, which we need to curb our, in, our gut instinct of like, Ugh, and say, oh, holy beans, unicorn, grab it, not attack, or, is it going to be a betrayal? At which point, what do we want to say about that? Well, that's more well, obvious. We we'll know what to say. We're used more to More obvious. Yeah. But here's the thing to think about in the long term. If progressives, by accident, get some of the things we've been demanding, and it would make a real difference to people's lives as far as stopping some of this damage, we shoot ourselves in the head politically. If in the face of helping working people, because we hate Trump, which count me in, we attack that and fight against it. That falls right into Steve Bannon's playbook, where Absolutely. it's like elitist blah blahs who hate Trump are trying to hurt working Americans. Hell if there's anything that comes out of this. There's gonna be so much damage because the tax scam incentivizes outsourcing. If we take some small bit out of that by getting rid of the outsourcing incentives in NAFTA, hallelujah, let's take it. Not sure we're gonna get it, but let's be on standby. Very good. Okay, now you know, folks, so we, we will uh, be all, all of us will be watching. And thank you, Lori Wallet, for speaking with us. This is Richard R.J. Eskow for Free Speech TV.